Hello and welcome to this episode of How to Be a Great GM. My name is Guy and today we're talking cobbles. Thanks to everybody who sent through imagery. Um, they are all absolutely fantastic. And um, I do appreciate the time and effort that you sent through. Uh, none of them really caught my eye in terms of being totally appropriate as cobbles. And that's because I think cobbles are in a strange space. Now, I've always had a very, very keen admiration for cobbles and for goblins as the diminutive little races that cause problems. But as I was putting this video together, as I was writing the script for it, I realized that cobbles and goblins are incredibly similar. And I don't like that. I don't like the idea that you have green-skinned goblinoids who are diminutive, burrowing, trap-building, vicious and sneaky. And then you've got the kobolds, who are basically dragonkin, who build tunnels and traps and are vicious and sneaky. There's very much a gap there, I feel, in terms of them being different. So I went on a quest to try and find out how we can make kobolds suitably different from goblins. And I think I found it. So you can agree or disagree with me on this video. And that's why it may or may not be something that you like. So, by definition, cobbles are the lowest form of dragonkin. They're reptilian, they worship the dragons as these almighty beings, and they claim sometimes some long-distance relation to the dragons themselves. Well, that's fantastic. And, for me, was the starting point from which... I could deviate from the standard cobbled idea and the standard goblin idea. The rest were, oh, they build traps and they do tunnels and the traps incorporate things like poison centipedes and natural based stuff. Well, goblins do the same thing. There's no reason to think that they wouldn't. So I then sat back and went, right, they're reptilian. Goblins are orc goblinoid, goblin humanoid, so that means goblins are warm-blooded. Cobbles, we know, <laughs> we know, lay eggs and are born in hatcheries as a clutch of eggs they are born and they are reptilian. That means that they are cold-blooded. Now that gives us our starting point to differentiate the way that cobbles act from the way that goblins act. Now why am I on this this quest to differentiate. Why can't they just be, well, that one's a red sort of scaly-skinned beastie that looks like a miniature dragon cross a Doberman, and that one's a small green puddle of snot. Why do I want to differentiate so desperately? Well, for me, it's about, well, why would I use another group of individuals that are exactly the same as one another? The stats are similar, not that stats are really important, but the whole flavouring is even the same. I want it to be different. So, with the idea of the reptilian approach, with the idea of them being cold-blooded, the lair, which is effectively tunnels and traps, which is the same as goblins, now starts to change. And there are a few things that will cause that to change. Generally speaking, reptilians, reptiles, are not too adverse to water. Their skin is waterproof, they're watertight, those scales and things keep the water out, so they can stay submerged in water for a very, very long amount of time. Unlike mammals, whose skin tends to start to slough off after being submerged in water for an extended period of time. So reptiles will have a lot more water in their lair. Another thing that got me thinking is that reptiles like heat. They don't like the cold. So that means that their lairs are going to be hot and humid. This starts to give me a very different type of lair from a goblin's lair. The goblins will have mess and clutter and be a bit damp perhaps, but the general feeling I have from a goblin lair is one of a cave where there's not a lot of attention paid to how it's been made. A cobbled lair, however, will have tunnels of densely packed mud pools of fetid water that they can lie in to help regulate their body temperature. Pools that might have aquatic sub-layered uh, tunnels leading off of them 
So now our adventurers are stuck in a very small space and they can see at the bottom of that pool there's a passageway which probably leads to the rest of their lair. They're going to have to go swimming, aren't they? There's also this incredible heat, this humidity helping to incubate the eggs. We get this warm sense. Again, very different now from how the goblins are starting to feel. As a matter of fact, I'd far rather run through a goblin nest than I would slither through a cobble's den. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. Ugh, I'm not a big fan of snakes. So just by looking at them from the reptilian cold-blooded perspective, the lairs now are starting to feel very, very different. And your players are going to have to encounter this cobbled space where there are these pools of water that they're going to have to go swimming in. That's an incredibly terrifying opportunity for you to really push that here are a bunch of little, diminutive, nasty, vicious creatures that will make use of their lair underwater. It doesn't mention it, but maybe cobbles are excellent swimmers. They can certainly hold their breath for a long time. Cold-blooded creatures generally can. They use less energy than the warm-blooded beings do. And yes, they're not as active as we are for as extended a period of time as we are. But when they're being attacked, you can be sure they'll be active. So you've got all these cobbles nipping around, swimming around, using those tails of theirs to manoeuvre through the water whilst you're slowly being picked to death by 12 or 13 of them that are definitely going to drag you underneath that surface of the water and drown you by just sheer numbers bawling around you and dragging you to the bottom. That's a much more terrifying trap to me than a spike trap or a trap that's filled with scorpions with stingy tails. So let's take it further. The egg laying component. Now we have a central core around which our entire goblin tribe will be based. Protect the eggs. That changes the mentality. Goblins don't have that. Oh, there's a little goblin kid. Well, I might eat it tomorrow because we're running out of food, but I'm not going to risk my life and limb to save it. Cobbles, reptiles, generally will eat other cobbles that they come across because they have absolutely no care in the world for others of their own kind. So cannibalism is a major factor. But the eggs, the eggs form the core of a cobbles den. They will protect those eggs at all costs. That is the future generation, or at least breakfast tomorrow, if you become the new dominant cobbled. So the lair starts to change shape. We've now got pools of water, these horrid little traps, humid. And if you have ever been near a crocodile or possibly an alligator, but I'm probably, probably, or any kind of reptile, there is a stench to them. They don't care. They don't have a sense of taste or a sense of smell. Uh, well, they do have a sense of smell. Let me recorrect. Crocodiles don't have a sense of taste. They don't have tongues. So there is a stink about reptiles that mammals don't have. It's a different, different odour. So there's this fetid reek that uh, permeates of uric acid, their excretia, which is this sort of paste-like substance. Cobbles won't care about that sort of thing. So there's this horrid, horrid space that your player's characters can get really stuck in. Generally speaking, reptiles are also incredibly patient. They're not impulsive. If they're going to strike, they strike because they can and they think they will succeed. If they don't think that they will succeed, they don't strike. Snakes, crocodiles, almost all reptiles behave in this way. They will sit there and they will wait. And only when the time is right will they strike with incredible speed, accuracy and usually deadliness. Poisons are a big thing. Constriction, restraining, dragging underwater. Those are the methods that kobolds will use. They're not strong. We know that. Absolutely fine. But they can be quick and they can certainly be deadly. Again, that's just something to build to your repertoire. And it's not stepping, none of this, by the way, is stepping too far away from the monster's manuals of both Pathfinder and Dungeons and & Dragons, almost all of their editions as well. It's not stepping too far away. It's just making them a bit more real, a bit more visceral, and a bit different from the standard goblins that we have. So the focus for gobbles, then, is on maintaining their territory. They're not expansionistic, necessarily. Reptiles don't care about territory. They just want to control their space, raise their young, eat their other young, 
eat anything that comes into their territory and survive. So that's how I would play them, is that they're incredibly defensive of their nest area, they're incredibly protective of that space, but they're not going to go on massive campaigns to take over the world. That's for goblins and orcs and lizard folk, you know, the bigger types. The, the warm bloods tend to do that. The cold bloods know that's all a waste of time. The flying kobolds, the urds, which can be used from time to time, start to paint a little bit more of a scary picture. You can have these flying creatures. They won't hunt necessarily at night. Very few reptiles do. There are some, of course. But generally speaking, it's a daytime creature. They need the heat. They definitely need the thermals to rise up into uh, the higher levels to get that flight happening so they don't burn too much energy, especially if you're going with a cold-blooded approach. Uh, they wouldn't want to waste a lot of energy doing that. We don't have a lot of flying reptiles. There are one or two, but not a huge amount out there because it takes so much energy to do so. And of course, without feathers or fur, maintaining that energy is difficult. So the flying cobble can be incorporated, and they don't change this whole approach very much. They have these wings. I wouldn't make them long-distance flyers. I wouldn't make them very fast flyers, and I certainly wouldn't make them very elegant flyers. I would make them flyers that can suddenly take to the air and then plummet down and land on their foes, delivering little venomous bi or bites and venomous tools to stab with and that kind. I also wouldn't make them very decorative in terms of the artwork and the items that they make. I would make them, I certainly wouldn't give them any clothing to wear. Why would they bother? They have got nothing to hide and they're cold-blooded so they have nothing to be ashamed of or afraid of either. They're covered in scales. They don't need loincloths and the like. There's nothing hanging down there anyway. It's all just a cloaca. So that is my take on cobbles. They are a lot more vicious, cold-blooded and savage. Oh, sorry. And savage than the goblins who are almost, in this light, nice to have. Give me a goblin over a cobbled any day. Anyway, what are your thoughts on cobbles? How do you differentiate cobbles from goblins? And do you actually differentiate from them in terms of how they play and how their tactics run in your games? Is there a necessity to do so? Or is it just you're attacked by cobbles, you're attacked by goblins, and that's as far as you go? Let me know in the comments below. And again, to all of our artists who submitted work, thank you so very much. Well, I think this pretty much concludes our tour of monsters. There's one or two more that we could have a look at. If there are any specific ones that you really, 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 really think that I should look at, mm, drop them in a comment below and we'll have a look and see. Anyway, thank you for being on this journey with me as these remarkable creatures. This week, and when the video comes out, I don't know, I have a friend coming over. I'm trying to do something very, very special where we talk about particular monsters and... Uh, just how things are sized up. Anyway, watch out for that video. It will be happening at some point in the near future. Until next time, I wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming.